I will be very brief. I will simply turn it over to Abby Williams, the president of the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to this panel discussion on 20 years of international criminal law from the ICTY to the ICC and beyond. I'm Abby Williams, president of the Hague Institute for Global Justice, and it is my distinct pleasure to moderate this discussion. First, I would like to thank the City of The Hague, the Royal Netherlands Embassy and the International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group for co-sponsoring this event. The Hague has been a symbol of peace and justice for over a century, since the first Hague Peace Conference in 1899. It is also the capital of the international judiciary. And this year, the Peace Palace, the home of the International Court of Justice, the judicial arm of the United Nations and the only main organ of the UN located outside of New York is celebrating its centenary. The Netherlands has a strong and admirable tradition of supporting the development of international law, indeed promoting the development of the international legal order is a permanent objective of Dutch foreign policy as required by the Constitution. Today we are privileged to have with us the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Mrs. Fatou Ben Souda, and the president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, George Ted Miron. Since its establishment two decades ago, the International Tribu Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia has changed the landscape of international criminal law and the ICC also plays a vital role in holding to account perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. I would like to introduce them briefly. Professor, uh, Prosecutor Ben Souda served as senior legal advisor at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and she had a distinguished legal career in her native Gambia, and served as Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Judge Miran is a leading scholar of international humanitarian law, human rights, and international criminal law. He has held professorships in a number of places, including at New York University School of Law. I think for this audience, it is appropriate to mention that he is honorary president of the American Society of International Law. Yes. Was. Was. <laughs> Prosecutor Ben Souda and Judge Miron have agreed that they will not give formal prepared remarks, and they said to me that they would like this to be a moderated session and a moderated conversation. So I thought what I would do, I would pose questions to them, and they will respond for about 40 minutes or so, and then I will open it up. Uh, to the audience. So, 50 minutes, uh, a discussion uh, between the judge and the prosecutor and myself, and then I'll turn it over uh, to the audience. So, let me start. Uh, prosecutor Ben Souda and Judge Miron. The ICC has been in existence for 10 years, and the ICTY for 20 years. What have you accomplished? <laughs> you go first? Yeah. Okay. The prosecutor first. wants me to go first. first. And who would argue is a prosecutor? <laughs> um, well, I think we accomplished a great deal. When the tribunal was first established by a Security Council resolution in 1993, we started from the scratch. After half a century of impunity, since Nuremberg, we had to show that uh, international criminal justice can again become credible. So we were the first court, international court, established since Nuremberg. You could say even we were the first uh, international court, period. Because in a way, despite the seminal and historic importance of Nuremberg, Nuremberg was in a way a victor's court. It was a court uh, um, convened by occupying powers. So the very establishment of the court, the fact that we established a record of credibility, 
which allowed the international community to follow, to follow this first act by establishing the special tribunal for Sierra Leone, the international, the first permanent court, the International Criminal Court, uh, uh, the special court for Lebanon. <coughs> Uh, this was uh, really a creation of a new universe of international justice with lots of problems. It took a lot of time, but the achievements were tremendous. The fact that we have, after some years, uh, arrived at 100% uh, law enforcement in the sense that all of our 161 indictees have been accounted for. This is a feat that not all international justice systems uh, could have achieved the fact that we have applied international customary law, not just in a few cases, as in Nuremberg, but in case after case, and that we have shown that even the most senior people, including heads of state, who have been accused of some of the gravest crimes known to humanity can be prosecuted and that we managed to all of our cases to apply a panoply of uh, norms of fairness and due process, I think these are tremendous achievements. Thank you, Prosecutor. Um, thank you for, for that question and um, also good evening to you all. I'm happy to be, to be here and having this discussion. Also thank our host state, uh, the Netherlands, for giving us this opportunity and of course the society. Uh, but to the question, I think um, the ICC uh, has also accomplished a lot. And it is without doubt that now the court has become a real player, an important player in international relations. Um, and this is done in 10 years. Uh, of course, we had a lot to learn from the ad hoc tribunals. Um, they have set the jurisprudence. But when the court started, we also had empty floors, empty corridors. We started from scratch. Uh, we have been able to develop policies of the office. We've been able to develop strategies. We have an operations manual. And uh, in 2003, we, 2002, we did not have um, any case. Today, we have uh, at least uh, eight situations in which has generated um, over 10 cases uh, before the court. And um, this, this is uh, something to be uh, uh, proud of. I think uh, also the fact that the ratifications of the statute is still is ongoing. We are getting, having corporations from states who have signed and ratified, but also from non-states parties. And uh, I will just give the example of what happened last week about the surrender of Boscon Taganda to the court and uh, the assistance of the United States and Rwanda, both non-state parties to the court, assisting for Boscon Taganda to be transferred to the court. Um, the, the, we, we, of course, have still uh, a lot to do. There are, there are many cases that we, we still are, are looking at, but I think this idea that we had in Rome, this has been translated to an operational institute that has become very important in international relations. Okay. Well, thank you. I want to follow up uh, on first on the point uh, that Judge Miran mentioned that one of the, the significant one of the significant uh, aspects of the ICTY was it was the first international criminal tribunal uh, since Nuremberg, the international military tribunal at Nuremberg, in a sense, had the luxury of having police powers to arrest and seize evidence. How do you deal with the challenge of arrest uh, without such powers, which the Nuremberg Military Tribunal had? Well, it's a very serious challenge. In fact, uh, during the first uh, lean years of the ICTY, we were, uh, my colleagues were there, and I, when I arrived there, we were really worried that the day may come that we will not have defendants before us. It, um, we are totally dependent cooperation of states. And initially, and for quite a few years, that cooperation was very slow in coming. 
It was only when the United States and the European Union uh, reached the conclusion that peace in Europe and uh, access by the states of the Balkans to the European Union required that justice be done and those states will cooperate with uh, delivering up to the Hague the principal defense and things started changing. It's not just the question of fugitives, important as it is, you cannot have a criminal trial conducted according to all the due process standards if you do not have the evidence. Oh. That evidence has to be collected thousands of kilometers away. Um, for that, you also need uh, support of uh, governments. And fortunately, over time, and thanks to the credibility that the tribunal has established, things uh, have started changing. And uh, I would like to acknowledge not only the role of the EU, EU at large and the role of the United States and pressing states to faster deliver people accused, indicted of very serious crimes to The Hague, but the Netherlands really played a very, very special role. Uh, when uh, uh, some kind of uh, tribunal fatigue started setting in more and more in the European Union, the Netherlands uh, remained the last man standing, insisting that uh, um, the rapprochement between Serbia and uh, the European Union will depend upon the delivery of General Mladic. And General Mladic was found and delivered to The Hague, making him our 161st indictees accounted for. And for that, we are eternally grateful to the Netherlands. But this problem of lack of police power continues to be a serious one. For example, when we as judges consider the question whether somebody should be given, as we call it, provisional release, and we would say here, given granted bail, we are deeply aware of the point that if he fails to come back, we would again be completely dependent on the state where he may be present, on having his, uh, him delivered back to The Hague. And in terms of, uh, in other questions, protection of, uh, of uh, witnesses. We are uh, again continue to depend on cooperation of states, and we are so dependent on the goodwill of the Security Council and the international community in making sure that that cooperation is forthcoming. Could I just follow up on, on that point about the relationship with the Security Council? Because the relationship between the international courts and tribunals and the Security Council uh, is, a, is a delicate one. Uh, to what extent are you dependent on the Council and how do you manage this delicate, delicate relationship with a body which is essentially a political body? And I'd also like the prosecutor to address that question as well. Maybe we'd start from there now. All right. Um, with respect to your first question on, on arrests, um, the, one of the biggest challenges, we, we have a, quite a number of challenges, but one of the biggest challenges that the ICC faces today is arrests, arresting those uh, wanted by the court and, and surrendering them to, or transferring them to the court. Um, th as you know, the, the court can only be able to function effectively if we have these individuals arrested and, and brought to the court. But the, the system that has been put in place by the Rome Statute, um, I call it a system and, and not a court. Um, in the sense that we are the judicial arm of that system. You know, we investigate, we, we, we prosecute individuals, but the decisions that the court takes um, are to be executed by the states themselves. As you know, ICC uh, um, is a voluntary institution in which states ratify and become part of the, of the court. Today we have 122 states uh, members of the ICC. But arrest, powers of arrest, executing the decisions of the court remains with the states. And this is why cooperation for us also is very huge, is, is big. If we do not have this cooperation, if we do not have this arrest taking place, 
it it would be um, the the court will be very it will not be effective as we wanted it to be. So that is that is the system that has been put in place by the Rome system. We are not meant to go out and arrest individuals, and of course this 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 is a challenge for us. But as I said, that is the system that has been put in place, and we continue to call on states. We continue to call on all partners to assist us in this regard. Uh, we have uh, many outstanding arrest warrants in all the situations that we are dealing with and uh, we are not able to um, proceed or progress with those cases because those individuals are not before the court. And uh, if you look at the situation of uh, President Bashir, for instance, who has been wanted by the court, I think since 2005, 2006, has been uh, an arrest warrant has been issued against him. It has been a big challenge for the state, but also for the for the court. Um, the the situation of Sudan was referred to the to the court by the United Nations Security Council, and Bashir, President Bashir, is all the time pushing the envelope, going to states that are parties to the Rome Statute, who have obligations under the Rome Statute to arrest and, and surrender him. But for one reason or another, you know, sometimes political reasons, he is not arrested. And in, a, in situations like that, as you know, there is so much that the court can do, apart from report back to the chamber, report to the uh, UN Security Council that this is uh, not happening. Um, the arrest is not taking place, uh, but uh, all the time, he, 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 he sort of pushes the envelope. And maybe br this brings me to the relations between the, your second question, the Security Council and the, and the ICC. In the first instance, uh, the Security Council can refer cases to the ICC, which they have done in this, in this um, Sudan, as well as Libya. Uh, they can also request the ICC to stop investigations or to stop prosecution, suspend for a year. Uh, they have the power of referral and deferral to, to, to the court. And this is um, a relationship that now I am, I am happy. The discussions are being put on the table. The relationship between the ICC and the... Because we get a political body, as you know, making political decisions and referring situations to a judicial body. Uh, the actions that the, uh, the UN Security Council takes, some, or the decisions that they make, affects us as a judicial institution. To the extent that the ICC is being accused of double standards, I always get the question of, oh, you are in Libya, why are you not taking Syria? Not knowing that Libya was referred to us by the UN Security Council because it's not a state party, but have not referred Syria to the ICC because it's also not a state party. So it is not the decisions of ICC, you know, that create that situation, but a political body acting, you know, they have their own responsibilities, and uh, 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 this, this, this affects us. But now, we had all those discussions behind closed doors. People talk about it, but for the first time, you know, we are making efforts to have the open discussions to also see the nature of the referrals that we receive from the UN Security Council, the fact that sometimes there is not always the support that we need, a follow-up that we need from the referrals we receive from the Security Council. All these discussions are, are taking place. Thank you. George Miron? Um, <coughs> our relationship with uh, the Security Council is perhaps even more complex because when the tribunal was established, by Resolution 827 of the Security Council, it was established as, quote, unquote, a subsidiary organ of the, United, of the Security Council. And I'm sure you will all agree with me that we are a bit uneasy about calling a court of law a subsidiary organ of the, United, of the Security Council. Now, on the positive side, however, and giving the entire credit to the secret various secretaries general of the United Nations, I must say that from the beginning, the secretaries general made it very clear to the United Nations and to the Security Council that in the exercise of our judicial functions, 
we will not be dependent on uh, mandates of the Council. We will do our judicial work independently, and judges indeed, although they are uh, nominated by governments, shortlisted by the Security Council, they are then elected by the entire membership. In fact, to be elected, you require an absolute membership of the a majority of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And from the beginning, we made it very clear that while we are dependent on the Security Council on amendments of the Charter, of the Statute, the Security Council is, in a way, our legislator. And uh, in a way, some, somewhat paralleling the role of the Assembly of State Parties for the ICC, while the Security Council during the last few years, to avoid destabilizing the court by elections, has routinely extended the term of office of judges, mm. while the Security Council has amended the statute, for example, to allow um, the election of ad litem judges and over time enlarged on their competences when it comes to the performance of our judicial duties, we are not guided by the Security Council and we are guided by our obligations as judges to apply the full panoply of due process rights. And for example, when I report every six months to the Security Council and am asked by the Council about the progress that we have made or are making or will make, with regard to the so-called completion strategy, I tell the Council very openly and transparently that we will do our best to go fast. We know that the Tribunal is a very costly proposition, but never ever at the cost of cutting corners on, on due process. And this is something that I must say the Security Council has accepted. And we have never encountered a case where we had a conflict between our dependence on the Council in many respects and pressure for us to abandon our basic obligations as judges who must act independently. Thank you. Prosecutor, you mentioned that uh, the ICC is often accused of double standards oh. and the issue is sometimes raised why are you in country X but not in country Y. And this issue, of course, usually is raised in the context of Africa. Mm -hmm. And the criticism that the ICC focuses only on Africa has been a constant uh, for years. Uh, is it a fair criticism? And what are you doing to answer it? I thought you were not going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this is a question I get all the time. But I will not be tired of answering this question because I, I think it is a criticism that is unfair to the court and uh, also unfair to the victims of, the, of these crimes. Um, if you look at uh, protecting the perpetrators of these crimes, if that is the only thing you're looking at, obviously you will make this criticism that we are targeting only Africans. But if you look at the millions of victims of these crimes, millions in all the situations across, uh, across Africa that we are dealing with, there are millions of victims of, of, of rape, of pillaging, of all sorts of atrocities, then you will, you will know that um, someone, some institution has to be there to protect them. Um, and again, I, I always refer back to the role that Africa has played in establishing this court. You know, those who, are, who were part of the negotiating teams know the big push that Africa as a continent and the stance that Africa took for the establishment of the court because it was needed. It was needed in Africa. And again, if you look at even the, towards the ratification process of the ICC, an African state, Senegal, was the first state that ratified the Rome Statute of, the, of, the, of uh, establishing the court. Today, if you look at the largest number of countries in any region that has signed and ratified the Rome Statute, it's in Africa. I think 33 countries now have, have signed and have ratified 
at the Rome Statute and are part of the court. If you also look at the fact that uh, the first referrals to the court, making the court to start work when it did, is also from Africa, and that is Uganda, um, uh, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. As recent as last year, one month after I took office, another African state referred a case to the, to the ICC asking for, for inter, intervention. And I, am, I applaud that. I applaud that because it shows that Africa is also very much interested now in, in accountability and the rule of law. You know, that is the other option that we have or that is the best option that we have in our hands, that the law must rule. Not violence, but the law must rule. And Africa is taking leadership in that. And it should be, the continent should be commended for that, not, uh, um, not, not uh, criticized for, 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 do, for doing that, going towards the ICC. And I always say that it is not really, in fact, ICC that is even going to Africa. With all the referrals that are coming, requesting ICC's intervention, I am saying that it is Africa that is coming towards the ICC, that is requesting ICC's intervention. And we, we also have to be frank. Uh, the, 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 the investigations that we are doing in Africa is because the crimes are also taking place there. They are these very serious crimes that are taking place and there is this opportunity for victims to have a voice, for victims to have access to justice. Otherwise, they, will, they, will, they, would, they would not. Um, so I take this criticism uh, very, very um, seriously. I think it is unfair. And I also say that um, if you don't want to be targeted, I always say that, if you don't want to be targeted, don't commit these crimes. <laughs> If well, I may uh, add, yes, maybe sure. I completely agree with the prosecutor on that. I think the ICC has been unjustly criticized. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. If you may ever make everything conditional on having an uh, equal playing field and uh, uh, eliminating selectivity everywhere at the same time, you will get nowhere. Yeah. Well, the, the pros prosecutor you mentioned, of course, in the uh, your last response that Africa is, it's demonstrating that it has an interest in accountability. And so I want to turn on to the broad issue of the purpose and nature of accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, the ICC has acquitted mm -hmm. one accused. The ICTR has acquitted two. And the ICTY has acquitted three. So as such, acquittals compatible with the purpose of accountability? Um, the, the ICC is a court, and its main, its responsibility is to deliver justice. And justice does not only mean convictions. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it also can lead to acquittals. Of course, it is not a good thing for the uh, prosecutor or the office of the prosecutor to have acquittals, but I think as a court, this has lent uh, more credibility to the fact that we will do justice. You know, the judges, the defense, the, the prosecution, we will do justice. And if at the end of uh, a, a case, it leads to a acquittal, but that justice was done, I think it is fair. Judge Miron? I, I'm glad that you asked this question because uh, my friends, the public at large is uh, sometimes uh, surprised, sometimes even astonished by acquittals. But it should not be. We are a court of law. We do not determine that crimes have not be com been committed. We do not give certificates of innocence. Mm -hmm. We um, are uh, international criminal courts as domestic court adjudicate guilt. They do not adjudicate innocence. We go by the case before us, we look at the evidence, yeah. Yeah. we look at the arguments of the parties, we look at the governing law, and we cannot ever be guided by a political agenda. We cannot be guided 
by a broader agenda. The day that we judges will decide cases depending on the consequences, that will be the end of international criminal justice. Sure. Not only for the ICTY, but for our colleagues at the ICC, always, we are always dealing with individual criminality. Whether the person who is in front of us can be found guilty beyond reasonable doubt. And if he doesn't, we may be very sad about it, but we have a clear judicial duty as uh, being in this business mm -hmm. to find people, uh, to acquit people. Uh, I realize that those acquittals from time to time cause great pain to the victims. Yes. But also acquittals in controversial cases domestically mm -hmm cause great pain to the victims. But let's not forget, we are a court of law and we are bound about it. But I would like to come back to, for a second, to your question about uh, accountability, if I may. First, let me say what I think accountability does not mean. Accountability, and I completely agree with the prosecutor of the ICC on that, accountability does not mean that every trial should end with, in a conviction. If it were, if every trial were, international trial, were to end in a conviction, uh, what would be the purpose of this exercise? We would be living in a world in which a person who is charged with an offense would almost necessarily and automatically be found guilty. This, I would suggest, would be anathema to what we mean by justice, to what we mean by rule of law, and what we mean by presumption of innocence. Okay. So do, what do we mean then, if this is not accountability, what do we mean by accountability? Now for me, accountability means that crimes will be investigated, that when there is sufficient evidence to suggest that a person may be responsible for a crime, that person will be tried, that that person will be tried according to the entire panoply of due process protections. In other words, what we mean by ensuring accountability is observing the rule of law. I believe that acquittals, just as convictions, show the health of the system. Would any one of us would want to live in a society where there would be a perfect record, 100% of convictions? I'm sure none of us. From uh, accountability, let's turn now to universality. Uh, and prosecutor, how important is universality to the ICC's success? And absent universality or in the face of gaps in the ICC's substantive or temporal jurisdiction, will there be a continuing need for ad hoc or hybrid tribunals? Um, I, I think the, the court was um, established at, the, at a time when there was really momentum for international criminal justice, for establishing a permanent independent uh, international court. And as I said earlier on, it's, um, it's a, a treaty-based institution that uh, states voluntarily uh, ratify the statute and become part of uh, part of the ICC. Of course, we are looking always towards more and more ratification of the statute. And uh, um, today we are 122, which I think is over half uh, already of the United Nations membership. Uh, but there's we we can we can it can be more, and we hope that it should be more. I think any country that is um, uh, concerned about international criminal justice um, should really look towards ratifying uh, the, 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 the Rome Statute and become, becoming part of the ICC family. And I, I, I know that uh, this is a decision that states take by, by themselves. It is not the ICC that would uh, uh, invite them to come. It's, it's, it's based on the policies of, of, of states as they wish and as they want to, to join the ICC. But I, I always say that, you know, 
we should be they should state should be encouraged to know that it is a it is a an institution that is um, uh, quite relevant and quite important in the fight against uh, um, uh, these these crimes this 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 um, uh, international crimes uh, that take place and it could it it does complement national systems uh, um, in that regard. So I, I, as I said, I, I am not sitting here to ex explain why states are not becoming part of the, the ICC, but um, the court will also function uh, even better. You know, this is not to say that the, co the court will not function without universality. As you can see, for the past 10 years, the ICC has done quite a lot uh, in that regard. But um, uh, having states to become part of it also will reduce, uh, to a great extent, the gap where where impunity can can be. Okay. Could I add to that? Yes, that? of course. Uh, this is, of course, um, an extremely important question, <coughs> and uh, uh, while the progress on ratifications of this ICC statute is continuing, which is a very very good thing. Um, we probably cannot expect before long that everybody will ratify the statute. Mm. And therefore, the power of the Security Council to refer cases ad hoc to the uh, ICC is an extremely important one. And I am very glad that my own country, the United States, has been changing its attitude towards it. I am glad that uh, the previous administration was willing to abstain on the referral of the question of Darfur, enabling that referral to take place. And I'm happy that the present administration has made it possible to, um, to send, uh, uh, with the United States, actual affirmative vote, huh? the case of Libya, Libya. Mm -hmm. to the ICC. Yeah. These are very, very good things. The question which is really so difficult to answer is how do we deal with the future? It may very well be that the last uh, 10, 15 years have been exceptionally successful in terms of international criminal justice. But um, this is somewhat changing. It is changing because the ICTY and the ICTR uh, will in a few years uh, be out of, uh, out of uh, will finish their task, will be functus officio. Uh, fortunately, the United Nations, instead of uh, deciding to go against the route of impunity, oh. has decided to establish this new tribunal with a terrible name, mechanism <laughs> to take over and continue. But uh, let me assure you, this is uh, a tribunal uh, which is a an, an totally legal tribunal. Uh, it is a tribunal, it is a court of law despite its <laughs> terrible name. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the answers. But what do we do when there is a situation where either for uh, legal or political reasons the Security Council does not wish to refer uh, a question to the ICC yeah. or the ICC cannot accept that? Can we accept that uh, impunity uh, uh, will uh, be the result? Mm -hmm. Can we accept that people who are committing terrible crimes will not confront justice. Uh, I personally would not exclude the possibility that should there be a need one day, mm. and I don't think that this would be anything which will be in any way critical uh, to the ICC or detrimental to its interests, maybe one day the Security Council or the international community or an, a regional organization will have to resort to some kind of a hybrid or ad hoc institution, simply to make sure that uh, atrocities are not left uh, unpunished. And I would like to leave it open and not closed. Uh, Judge Miran, you mentioned the residual mechanism. Uh, we hope it won't be a mechanistic approach to these problems. <laughs> I can assure you, uh, not me. <laughs> But I was wondering, what challenges have you faced in establishing it? And what challenges do you foresee in pursuing its mandate effectively. Could you say something about that? Well, it's a very, very interesting experiment. In fact, in contrast to the ICTY and the ICDR, mm -hmm. 
the international community with the establishment of the mechanism, we call it MICT, Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunals, has established a new model of international justice, a model which will operate in a much more economical way, perhaps uh, from a manager's perspective. Uh, I am, uh, have been appointed by the UN Secretary General, its president. It will be very difficult to operate, but the idea is that there is a roster of 25 judges elected, including myself, by the UN General Assembly. And those judges will merely be on the roster until the president invites them to sit on a case, either a trial case, because we still have nine fugitives from the ICTR. Three of them are high level and should be tried by an international court and not just referred to Rwanda or elsewhere uh, for trial. So. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we have that panel, uh, which is very interesting because judges will not be paid an annual salary. They will not be paid a retainer. And it, um, this sounds great on paper, and it's potentially an efficiency measure, which is also an economic, very um, uh, uh, economy promoting measure. But it is not certain that if, uh, when the day comes, not if, when the day comes, and I have to phone judges X, Y, and Z, they will tell me, Ted, it's very nice of you to think of us, but we have a family to support and we have jobs. Mm -hmm. Because in contrast to the other tribunals, the statute of the residual mechanism allows judges to have other occupations, mm -hmm. and which is quite clear because they must they must support themselves and their family. What is interesting is that the, uh, one of the problems legally we had is how to establish normative continuity between the ICTY and the ICTR on the one hand and the mechanism, because the mechanism will be a sole institution which will take over both from the ICTY and the ICTR. So we... Um, had to make sure that the crimes to be applied would be the same. But this is not crimes alone. Then we had to work out to draft rules of procedure, which would be a, a continuation of rules of procedures of both the ICDY and the ICTR. And then when there are differences in practice, we had the conceptual question, do we follow the rules of the ICTY? Do we follow the rules of the ICTR, or do we go by the principle that the result more advantageous to the person, to the convicted person, to the accused, will be followed? And this is the choice that we have made. For example, in the ICTY, we have the practice of considering a person eligible for early release after the person has served two-thirds of the sentence. In the ICTR, it's three-fourths. And there was, there was a question of human rights here. Which of those principles we followed? This is now my responsibility, sole responsibility, which is not an easy one as president, according to the statute established by the United Nations. And I've decided that I will follow the human rights norm of preferring a solution which is uh, most advantageous to the person, to the convicted person. But there was a, a range of, uh, of uh, very interesting situations here, which we have resolved. We are already operational for the Arusha branch. We have been operational since 1 July 2012. And on 1 July 2013, the Hague branch of the mechanism will also become operational. Well, before I uh, open it up to questions from uh, the audience, let me just pose one uh, final question. Um, let's assume that there is some benevolent entity that can grant you one wish, <laughs> give you one thing, mm -hmm. or make one change that would vastly improve mm -hmm. the way that the, your tribunal works, either the ICC or the ICTY. What would you ask for? Arrests. <laughs> yeah, arrest is uh, it's it's an important uh, aspect of the work of the ICC. Having you know investigated and um, 
identified individuals who we um, take to be the persons bearing the greatest responsibility, I think it would be um, uh, good if we could have those individuals before the court uh, to to continue with the with the process of bringing bringing justice uh, to to the victims. Thank you. I, I agree. I think also perhaps put more broadly, yeah. cooperation of states. Yes. We are completely, we have no, please remember that the International Criminal Courts operate in an environment which is so different from that in which domestic courts, criminal courts operate. Mm -hmm. A court of law in the United States mm -hmm. uh, uh, has contacts with and can count on the support of the Department of Justice on uh, the Department of Finance, and so on, on the Treasury. Uh, we uh, are there completely out alone, and we have to create for ourselves all those structures um, uh, regarding, for example, funding of defense. And if in order to accomplish our tasks, we really need support of the international community for fugitives, first of all, but more broadly for everything that we are trying to do. Good. Thank you. Well, let us open it up to <coughs> questions from the floor. Um, I know that the two microphones are uh, here, but we... So perhaps you could just line up by the microphone. Where is it going? Sorry? Oh, okay. And, uh, Hi. My name is Jamie Rowan. I'm with the American Bar Foundation. Uh, I have a question. Given that we're a room full of both academics and practitioners, I'm curious how how you see the role of legal academics in your work. What kinds of work is beneficial for the courts? What kinds is detrimental? Both legal theory as well as empirical work on atrocities. Thank okay. you. Good. Let me take another. Um, Simon Chesterman from National University of Singapore. I thought I'd do the flip side of Abhi's opening question and ask if we were coming back 10 years from now, what do you hope you would be able to say are the achievements in international criminal law and Ted, if I may, do you think the mechanism will still be in existence? Okay. And one more. I'll take it in, in threes. Um, my name is Benjamin Forens. Um, my question is whether it would be helpful for the ICC as well as for the transfer of cases by the ICTYNR to strengthen the complementarity provisions which are already in the statute and put greater emphasis on transferring cases to the domestic jurisdiction of as many states as you can possibly get to accept it. And if so, what do you recommend and think the public or we can do to accelerate that process? Okay. Thank you. Uh, prosecutor, do you want to start off um, on yes. the role perhaps of legal academics? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, of course, find um, legal academics to be very, very important for, for our work, um, um, especially in terms of the uh, research uh, that they are able to, to do in various um, um, aspects of, 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 what, of what we do. And uh, as you know, we also uh, request, make requests to them to which they give to us on voluntary basis. I will here mention, I have, I think, two special advisors who are present here from the academic world who are helping my office uh, in important issues like uh, crimes against and affecting children in, in conflict and also in, 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 in other aspects of the world. So it's, they also do criticize the office I always hope that those criticisms will continue to be constructive ones, taking into account the practicalities of what we deal with, because that is one problem that we have. Sometimes we receive these criticisms not based on, on the practical aspects of our work, but um, on <laughs> and, and this first, this is not, not helpful. The, the office is, of course, willing always is always ready to uh, work with and to um, interact and exchange with academics. We are open to that, uh, but we, we also hope that it, it continues to come, but in a constructive way that will move the 
uh, issues forward and not just criticize because you, you have the ability to do so. But the academics are very important for our, our work. I, I, I need to emphasize that. Um, I think the other question was... Uh, Simon's question about... Uh, Principal complementarity. I think that's, that's your question, but I'll just talk about complementarity. Um, uh, ben, you, you, I mean, you more than anybody knows that the court complements national system. And uh, I think the idea that we had in establishing this court is that national systems should take or would take up the responsibility of investigating and prosecuting. Because once they do that, the ICC will not, will not intervene. But if you look at practically what is happening, um, the capacity, capacity for the national systems, at least those that have referred cases to the ICC, the capacity for them to do so, or sometimes even the, the willingness, because it is unable or unwilling to, to investigate and prosecute, it is, it is also that that is lacking. And I think we try to um, ensure that we try to, to make sure that these, these states that refer cases to us or where we have jurisdiction to be able to go in and investigate and prosecute, the last thing that we do is to want to open investigations there. And during the course of our preliminary examinations of these situations, one of the aspects that we look at is whether that state is in a position to investigate and prosecute or is actually doing it because it is only then when they are not doing it that we intervene. And if you look, the typical example of Guinea. Guinea has been on the, on the preliminary examination for some time now, uh, I think since 2009 until now. And what the, all the efforts that the, the office has been making is to look for ways in which Guinea can investigate and prosecute by themselves. And we have even gone to the extent of looking for third, uh, third parties who can assist because the lack of capacity is there. There may be a willingness or there may be even uh, the expertise and the experience found on the ground, but the, the, the um, basic logistics of investigating and prosecuting is, is, is a problem. And we, I have uh, consistently been contacting the government I have written letters, I have met with the president, I have uh, also uh, tried to encourage the president to give to this panel of judges that was um, uh, established to investigate the crimes, to give them, to help them with the capacity to be able to investigate the crimes. So it is, it is not always a question of um, that ICC does not want or that the, uh, uh, does not want the particular state concerned to investigate and prosecute, but it is also the lack of capacity, which brings, <clears throat> brings me to where the international community comes in. Because um, we are not meant, we are not a development agency. ICC is not that. And I think there are other agencies and other countries and partners that can help these particular states to, for them to undertake investigations and prosecutions by either providing them with the expertise or providing them with logistics or providing them with the technical assistance that they need to investigate and, and, and prosecute. Judge, do you want to touch on Simon's, Chesterman's question on 10 years? Yes, actually, I would like also to say one word about the academic, and the academic angle. As well. angle. Mm -hmm. um, as someone, for someone who has spent a quarter <laughs> of a century, uh, teaching uh, international law to say that uh, academic work is of no relevance would be suicidal <laughs> and I would of course uh, not do that. Uh, at the same time make it, let me make it very very clear judges are working exceedingly hard. Mm -hmm. They read briefs consisting and materials consisting of virtually hundreds of pages and therefore it's extremely important for the parties which means for the prosecution mm -hmm. and for the defense. When there is an important point to be made, drawing on legal science or academic writings to make sure that they make the point in their briefs. 
because there is a limit um, to what uh, judges can do in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the question uh, that uh, you have asked me about uh, the mechanism in 10 years from now. Yes, the mechanism will still be existing because the way that the Security Council has um, uh, uh, articulated our various mandates, it is quite clear that some of the most high-profile appeals, the appeal of Mr. Karadzic, the appeal of General Mladic, and the appeal of Mr. Hadzic, will in fact be adjudicated not by the ICTY, but by the mechanism. Moreover, we will have a continuing competence of a request for review, a continuing competence of our questions of pardon and early release. And therefore, I expect that the mechanism will still be existing 10 years from now. And my own ambition for the mechanism is to try and counter the criticism which has been made against the all international criminal courts, that we are slow. People forget what kind of cases we deal with. Mega cases covering a large territorial space, large, large temporal space in terms of victims, that every single word has to be translated, that we always have, even for people who choose to represent them, themselves. We have to give them the entire panoply of due process protections, making it sure that the timetable we establish is one with which they can cope. So there are, there are many problems here, but still I would like, uh, if I could, to make the mechanism a successful experiment to show the international community that you can have both justice and efficiency. I don't know whether it will be possible, but I will at least try. I'm going to take another round of uh, three questions. First, Rebecca Hamilton, uh, soon to be an associate at Columbia Law. Um, during the, first, the term of the first prosecutor, the emphasis was on getting cases to the ICC. We weren't sure whether uh, the ICC would get any cases at all. Uh, but that hurdle is obviously being cleared, and now you have uh, essentially a zero growth budget, uh, the Security Council handing you cases. Uh, at some point, the question is, is going to come, when do you exit a situation? And I was wondering if you could talk to us about thinking inside the court on what the guidelines would be for that and perhaps particularly how it might relate to this question of capacity at the national level. Uh, is the ability and willingness of mm -hmm. national jurisdictions to take on and, and finish justice going to be part of your thinking on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Ademola Abbas for United Nations University. Just two short questions to the uh, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, I own up as one of those people who has been asking you these unfair questions mm -hmm. about the, uh, whether the ISIS has been fair to Africa. Mm -hmm. And if you remember in Albany Law School last year, precisely in April, Albany Law School, I asked the question why the ICC has a very low appetite for non-African cases. And your response, if I remember, is pretty much what you responded, what you repeated tonight, is the mm -hmm. fact that in terms of jurisdiction, it is only when the Security Council refers, mm -hmm. you know, non-member state situations under Article 13 to the ICC that you can act, which is true. But don't you think, though, um, the question is, does the ICC actually, can the ICC say no to Security Council when the Security Council refers cases? Because I think if it feels that it always has to investigate any time the Security Council referred the case to ICC, it is becoming a poor cousin of the Security Council. What is your response to that? Okay. The second one, I was hoping that the moderator will actually talk about the relationship between the ICC and Africa for now. And that is because the African Union, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, you know, uh, there's a new protocol, as you are aware, which has expanded the jurisdiction of the court. Now, we don't know whether to be adopted or not, but I'm quite keen on hearing your view about what the potential relationship of the ICC and the African Court of Human and People's Rights will be while the, protest, uh, the uh, protocol to enter into force. From one point of view, the ICC can only adjudicate on war crime, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Now, the new protocol of the African Union confers the African Court with such crimes as unconditional changes of government, like military coups and whatsoever, over which the ICC has no jurisdiction. Now, the question then for you is, what if African states will come to you and say, look, we have to prosecute these cases, these crimes, because we have codified them 
as you know, in the African Charter on Democratic Governance 2012, and the ICC cannot prosecute it. What will be your response to that? Thank you. Just take a third. Hi, my name is Bruce Segueras, a practitioner here in Washington. And my question goes to the ability of the courts to ascertain the assets of the defendants in certain cases. A good example of this would be in the Charles Taylor case, where it was said that he had huge amounts of money, but yet he um, had public defender. I mean, he had a, 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 def a defender in part because um, the court or the registry was unable to show that he did have uh, a lot of wealth. It also bears on the ability to trace, freeze, seize, and, and forfeit assets and also use them to compensate the victims. I mean, you have this in virtually all the cases. So my question is, do you think that the courts have the appropriate authorities and the resources to be able to accomplish these goals? And if not, um, what would you suggest in terms of improving upon the authorities and the resources to accomplish these goals? Thank you. Thank you. Prosecutor? No. I, um, I think the first question was um, coming from Rebecca. Hi. Um, about existing guidelines, I believe, on, on the situations that we investigate uh, uh, and, and prosecute where we are. Um, like the ad hoc tribunals, um, there should come a time when the uh, court has to exist, exit uh, a particular situation. We cannot be there forever. Um, if you look at what we did in, um, in, the, in the DRC, uh, it was a situation where um, the conflict was sort of moving in terms of gravity from one, f one area to another and, and continues to do so. And we have found the, um, the need to investigate and prosecute in DRC in, in phases, if I may put it that way. Uh, because at the time we started with um, uh, Lubanga, the, 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 uh, the time of, uh, we started the investigations, Ituri was the gravest. And that is where we, we thought we should uh, focus our investigations and prosecutions. And recently we, have, we are moving, we are looking into, into the Kivus. Uh, exiting the country um, completely, um, it's, it's a huge responsibility. I, I have to say that it's a huge responsibility because what we were looking to do um, for to be to be able to exit and and also do so uh, with a clear conscience is to make sure that um, the plans we had for working with the local judiciary to also investigate themselves take up these cases that it happens. Unfortunately. Um, it has not quite worked out that way. Because that is one, one way where we think that um, if we go into a, a country, um, use positive complementarity, uh, make sure that uh, we, 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 we uh, at least get the country to be assisted, the state to be assisted by uh, others, other partners to also investigate and prosecute, then it will be easier for ICC to now exit and for the local judiciary to take over. But um, in the DRC, the example I'm, I'm giving, we have had huge problems and it is mainly problems of security. It is mainly problems of protecting the witnesses. It is problem, problems of even the security of the judges themselves. Uh, the judges and also the security of the staff of the ICC. So this has not been possible but one of the ways that we're looking at exiting a, a, a country is, is that. And sure, um, try to look for ways in which the local judiciary can take over and ICC can, can exit and look at other, other situations. Um, I, yeah, I had a long question from uh, my friend about the low appetite for non-African state uh, uh, cases. And I think uh, as you have seen, I have responded to that early on. I think it's one of the main questions that you, you, add, you, you asked. But coming to the question of 
um, this protocol by the African Union establishing this uh, um, uh, court or division where that will try ICC cases. Um, I always say that uh, we, we must continue to look for ways of addressing these crimes. We must make sure that there should not be impunity for the crimes. And if it, uh, it is the choice of the African Union to establish this division that will investigate and prosecute these crimes, I think there is, uh, it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. It is not that um, it is because the ICC will not work if this happens. I don't think so. And also, if you look at the issue, even if you extend the issue of complementarity, uh, we are looking towards maybe now national systems to work uh, and investigate and prosecute these crimes. But if also regional systems are able to investigate and prosecute this, I do not think that that is uh, something that the ICC would be against. <coughs> and there was a third the question. The third question relates About to the, the ability of court to ascertain the assets of defendants and yeah. how that could be strengthened. Yeah. Um, in our investigations uh, uh, of these cases, that is one of the, the things that we do. We firstly also try to investigate the assets of the individuals. Uh, and for that, again, we come to the issue of cooperation. Cooperation with states. We have to request for states where we think or where we suspect we are able to trace the assets of these individuals that uh, um, uh, we ask for assistance from that. Uh, but I have to say that uh, with respect to that, we have not been, um, I don't want to say not successful. Um, we have had our challenges. Let me put it that way. We have had our challenges in states assisting us to, to, to trace the assets of individuals and to, to be able to request for them before the, state, the, the court to be, to be frozen. We do have um, a, a mechanism already in the, in the office to do that, and we have been trying for a long time now to set up the, uh, a unit that will only deal with investigations, financial investigations, not only for freezing or tracing of, of assets, but also to look at the proceeds of these crimes and also to look at who is sponsoring these crimes. This is something that my office is uh, looking at seriously, and uh, we, of course, will seek help you know, outside of the office to do that. But um, it has been a challenge to, to get to get this. And we have seen defendants, you, uh, not only Charles Taylor, but in, before the ICC, you have seen someone like Laurent Bagbo, who is a president, who was a president of Cote d'Ivoire, being uh, uh, provided, defense being provided by the court. You've seen Jean-Pierre Bemba, who is believed to be very rich, is also being supported uh, by the court. And that is because we have not been very successful we've been we've had our challenges in knowing and tracing where exactly their their assets are uh, unfortunately <coughs> uh, we've run out of time so I apologize to uh, uh, the three uh, colleagues who have stood by by the microphones for a while but I'll give the the just the last word to judge Meran who wants to say something briefly before I, winding up. just very briefly with regard to those situations in which the Security Council refers cases to the ICC. I do not think that the United Nations should get a free lunch. I mean, mm -hmm. if we send cases to the ICC, it is fair mm -hmm. that the United Nations should budget them. Mm -hmm. It is not fair that the other memberships, mm -hmm. m members of the ICC should do it. It is, I think, uh, a basic norm that the UN should accept responsibility for funding those cases Conceptually, mm -hmm. when the Security Council uses the ICC for those referrals, mm -hmm. it is very much as if it were the Security Council were treating the ICC as an ad hoc tribunal, except mm -hmm. that the tribunal is standing, yeah. which produces a much greater economy and efficiency. But the United Nations should accept 
that it should pay for that exercise. Mm -hmm. um, just, just oh. one. I think there was a question of saying whether we are we are bound to take all the cases that the UN UN Security Council will refer to us. But as you know, when we get these referrals, we still have to um, do our preliminary um, assessment of whether the crimes fall within the ICC jurisdiction uh, or whether they are ICC crimes and we make all this assessment and if we do find that they are not we will we are not bound to take cases referred to us by the UN Security Council. Well this has been a fascinating and stimulating <coughs> discussion uh, it only remains for me to thank George Miran and the ICC uh, prosecutor and to thank you um, for attending this session. I should also uh, let you know that there is a reception uh, sponsored uh, by the city of The Hague in the Mount Vernon room, I think, following this session, and you're invited to attend. And I should just make a, a pitch for the Hague Institute for Global Justice, <laughs> which I uh, represent. <laughs> Be delighted to see you if you come to The Hague and to welcome you to the uh, new institute. Join me in thanking uh, George Miron and the prosecutor. <laughs>